In this video, we're continuing with our analysis of probabilistic functions, and we are going to spice things up a little bit by making this look noticeably different. So for this function, we're going to sample a random variable, and then depending on the value of that variable, whether it's one or anything else, we perform different operations. If it's one, we do this first for loop that goes from n to n squared, and if it is anything else, we do the second for loop, which is n log n. One very natural way to analyze this might be to say, how likely is it that we execute those lines of code right there? How likely is it the probability of that occurring, the probability that k is 1, if it's uniformly random, like we're assuming it is, it would be one possibility out of n options. And how about that second block of code? Down here. What is the probability that we actually execute this code? This is when k isn't equal to one. How many options are there? There are n minus one options out of n possibilities. That's one way to compute that. You could also compute this as it's the exact opposite of the above statement. It's the probability that k is not equal to 1. So it's 1 minus the above probability. And just to verify, this is n over n minus 1 over n. Those are the same. So either way is a valid way to compute that value. Let's find out what is the expected runtime of this code? The expected time given that k is equal to 1 is it's going to be a constant times the top bound minus the bottom bound plus 1. And the expected runtime of this code down here, so the expected runtime given that k is not equal to 1 is c n log n. Now we need to compile this information into something useful. So I know 1 nth of the time I execute the orange block of code. So that means that if I wanted to compute the expected runtime et of n, without any sort of conditions on that. Well, one nth of the time, I know it takes C times N squared minus N plus one, and the remaining N minus one over N time, it takes C N log base two of N. And that is actually entirely true. We just invented a useful formula that is the, how to use conditional probability to analyze problems like this. So I stole this from the notes above. This says that the expected value of any variable can be computed as the expected value given that something is true. A can be anything, for example, k equals one, times the probability that th that, that the thing is true, plus the expected value when that thing is not true, times one minus the aforementioned probability. This second term here could also be written as the probability of not A. With all this in mind, we use this formula, the conditional expectation, something you may have never seen before, but hopefully it seems intuitive if you're just looking at the code and saying, how likely is it that this thing happens times the time that it takes to occur. This is exactly what we were doing before when we were using our formal definition with the summation. We only have two possibilities here though, but it is the same idea. So this term is in theta of n squared over n or theta n. The second term is in theta of, well, my n's cancel but I still have an n in my numerator, so it's n log n. So 
So et of n is in theta of n log n. To finish this, maybe we discuss the best case and worst case running times. The best case would be that it performs the second algorithm. Why is that? If we look at the runtime of these different for loops, the first for loop actually takes longer to run. So this first for loop is in theta of n squared, and the second for loop is in theta n log n. So for this algorithm, the worst case worst case will be theta of n squared, that we actually execute that first for loop. And the best case would be theta n log of n. And now we fully categorize this. This is an interesting example compared to our last two because now our expected time is the same as our best case running time.